When it comes to long-term success in fitness, the following is absolutely true. Progress is not linear. It just isn't. It's more of a trend. In other words, sometimes you get better, sometimes you pause, sometimes you get a little worse, but what you wanna look at are the trends. Do I overall improve? At the end of the year, am I better than I was at the beginning of the year? If you fall in love with the linear progress, you will overtrain, you will hurt yourself, and you will be disappointed. This one, uh, you know why this is such a challenge? Because when you first start, all progress is linear. Like when you first get started, it's always straight up. And then you plateau and you're like, ah, oh, what am I going to do? Or if you go back a little bit, right? Like think, I about, all this think about that. Like as far as like if uh, you compared it to the analogy of like working, right? And you got paid a wage and you get paid this nice wage for your job. You put in the work every day. Mm -hmm. You'd go to the gym. You do your hour. You go to your job. You work, whatever like that. You get paid this wage consistently. And then all of a sudden that wage decreases and yeah. decreases and decreases and like how often are you going to continue to show up to that job? I feel like that's what happens to so many people mm. is yeah. you get, you get that initial response yeah. of you've made some positive changes nutritionally. You've made some positive changes, moving and exercising. The body responds. You drop some weight on the scale. Maybe you notice a little bit of firmness in your muscles mm -hmm. and you're getting excited and then the plateaus start coming and then it's diminishing like, returns. Yeah. And then what ends up happening, you do more work and then you feel like you get paid even less. Mm. And so then that's eventually where people break and they stop going. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with looking at, I mean, it's I think like being taxed. I think it's smart to look at a plateau and say, is there something I can do differently uh, to get the ball moving forward? But once you get to a certain point and you've been doing this for a few years, um, it's, it's a step ladder really. I mean, adding, adding 10 pounds to your, deadlift uh in the first year is i mean it's guaranteed i mean you'll add 10 pounds to your deadlift in the first few weeks adding 10 pounds to your deadlift after 10 years uh is a success that's like a massive success right mm -hmm. so to your analogy of making money right you get your first job flipping burgers at mcdonald's it's pretty easy to get a higher pay by switching jobs and becoming more skilled yeah but then you start to reach that top and it's much harder to get you know higher pay you have to start to figure things out but progress with fitness is is not this like every time I touch the weights or I should always expect to be able to handle more volume, handle more load, get stronger. First of all, the, the context of your life changes all the time. Uh, you get older, hormones change, you know, who knows? But also it just the body doesn't adapt that way. There are limited resources and you got to kind of figure things out as you continue to progress. And um, it is a step ladder. Like uh, it, it took me a while to accept this. Once I accepted it, like now when I work out, I don't, uh, you know, it's not like this huge disappointment if I'm lifting less, less weight mm. than I did before. In fact, I, I expect to not be anywhere near my PR weights most of the time. It's just, it's just the way it is. But if I, if I, you know, married that philosophy of linear progress, I would be so overtrained and beat up and injured and, you know, going down the wrong path or maybe quit. Maybe I would quit altogether. So that's just, you know, that's just the bottom line with progress and fitness. The reason why it's slow is not because you progress incrementally every month. It's because you go through spurts of progress, spurts of plateau and drops, yeah. but you, you want to look at the trend. Well, you have to reinforce other areas, other aspects, uh, in order to keep progressing. Forward. That's true. So it's like, you have to address some things that you may have left in the, uh, you know, in, in the, in the hang in terms of like, like reinforcing your joint strength oh, yeah. and stability, point. like, uh, in terms of recoverability, uh, you know, there's a whole host of other factors that, um, contribute towards building muscles. And it's like, if we're just myopically focused on loading a little bit more weight and, That'd be rad if I could just add those little fractional weights all the time and like continuously just see progress. I was thinking about this, like what if it was like linear progress was the move? Like where do you guys think your PRs would be at this oh, point? Oh God, I've been working out since <laughs> I was 14. I'd be, <laughs> like, I'd be benching 5,000 Yeah, 5,000, right? Yeah. Like, we're up in that range. Like, yeah. How yeah. sick would that be? That yeah. would be uh, that would did be you guys Did you guys listen to the podcast that was shared in our forum about our message around uh, – not doing cardio for weight loss. Did you not listen to it? No. Oh, I listened to it last night. It was actually pretty good. Wait, our podcast? No, 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 no. Somebody in our forum shared another podcast. Oh, okay. They're they're basically they were just encouraging us to that. Hey, your guys's 
you guys keep fighting the good fight. Your oh, message is yeah. finally getting out there that cardio is a terrible. Somebody else is voicing it. Huh? So this guy, uh, and maybe by the end of the podcast, Doug can look up on the forum and maybe give him get his name. And we could we could shout him out, and give him some love. Uh, he he had, he started this podcast, and the, I, the gist of it from what the little bit that I listened to uh, is he's on a two hundred pound weight loss journey. Oh, and he's been documenting the whole thing, and he's already like, oh, he's, interesting. He's like two three years deep into it. Wow. And he found- 200 pounds? 200 pounds. So wow. his, his goal, so I listened to it for a good like half hour or so to get, kind of like get an idea of what like this whole thing was about. And so he set this goal in 2000 and I want to say 20, 2020 or 2021. He set this goal to lose 200 pounds. Then from there, he's going to decide, do I want to try and look more like Bruce Lee or do I want to try and look more like uh, The Rock? Mm. Like decide the body type he wants. Huh. The first and and really his 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 the reason why he I said, love how they make it seem like it's just an easy choice. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know I mean? yeah. In this hand, I have this. Yeah. Well, the and he he lays out the the idea of that not so sure much. like smaller more well, right athletic, right and, and really what it is is that athletic. when I lose this two hundred pounds I'm not done that Big I want to yeah, I, yeah. I want to continue no, the journey it. right so that it. that's kind of his message right and so he's been doing this for a while now and, and been documenting on the on this podcast. He gets hit with some advertising that says cardio is a terrible thing for fat loss. What about that? And he says he sees the advertisement, and then the advertisement is a pitch for fat loss pills. So he just dismisses the information. Wait, wait. Yeah. So they say cardio is a terrible way to lose fat. Yeah. Take and our pills. Yes. <laughs> yes. Hey, yes. hey, I want to say this right now. Cardio is uh, way more effective than fat loss pills <laughs> for fat loss. However bad cardio is for fat yeah, loss, yeah. way better Damn, than fat loss pills. Damn, companies always find an angle. I, I, thought, I thought that was so funny, right? By like, the way, that's a good sign because they're it, well, they, they it shows figured that, out that's us right. spreading that message. Right, right. So it's like it's like we've we've made a dent, right? The, 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 there's now marketing around wow. that message and now even for supplements, right? So Those fuckers. anyways, so he, say, he goes on to say that and then he says he finds this podcast referring to Mind Pump. And he goes, and the guys in there are talking about, and he, he's, and he, I guess he listened to that same episode. It's actually, it sounded like he didn't say the episode. It sounded like the one where we talk, uh, we were talking specifically to women about why women should oh. go on a bulk. Oh yeah. And cause he's like, you know, we, we really make the case for why you should increase calories and send a signal to build muscle because of what that will do metabolically for you and how much easier it will be then to lose the weight mm -hmm. later. And then to also to maintain that. Why it was really good and why I liked it was that you could tell, obviously, this is not his field, but he did a real good job of like distilling the information that we have laid out there. And it also highlighted for me, like how many times we've have, we have to repeat this of course. Mm -hmm. for like that light bulb switch. And he says like he in the thing he's talking and he's like, I've heard this message many times, mm -hmm. but it wasn't until we put like numbers to it and, and, and made it like explain like, listen, you lose 10 pounds five of its muscle, five pounds of fat. This is what happens to your metabolism. Yes, you're on the scale this much, but you also lost muscle. Yep. Mm -hmm. Therefore, your your metabolism has gone down. Now imagine if I could just add five pounds to your of muscle to your body, your body now naturally burns, say 200, 300, 400 more calories a day. And so he said that is what really clicked for him was that math of figuring that out, which by the way, was the thing that I brought up the other day of why I get really upset at the fitness space that tries to counter that science uh, because yeah. it loses somebody like that. Yes. Because all it takes is that same type of a person yes. who hears us ex explaining how, how important it is to build muscle, to speed your metabolism up. And then all of a sudden you're going to get some other science nerd guy who's going to be like, well, mm -hmm. technically the studies say chewy. this. Yeah. And then he goes, Oh, it's well, then, minimal. So yeah. Then he'll dismiss bother. the whole message that we're presenting because maybe you hear this other other fitness person who's talking about it but I thought wow. it was really good. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. By the way, this, uh, uh, if you're a coach or a trainer listening right now, let that be a lesson to you that you can communicate a message that's correct and accurate, but if you don't sell it well, oh. you might as well say nothing. Yeah. The, I mean, um the mess the way that we communicate what we communicate, we literally had to learn through trial and error with our clients. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many times I've talked about fat loss yeah. and muscle building you know how many analogies i've worked through to, try to find the right one <laughs> do you know do you know this is why I'm, I'm actually more annoyed i get more upset when i see really smart fitness professionals that are are presenting this type of information yeah. science-based information which right that's going to be kind of sound kind of crazy i'm I, i'm more empathetic to the dumb trainer who's just trying his way through business right and maybe that's because i identified as that i was a dumb kid who didn't know much i was trying to figure it out myself trying to just doing my best to give people the best information that yeah. I had. 
I really don't like the, the, the ones that are highly educated, lots of certifications, really, really intelligent, and go so deep in the weeds that they end up losing people. Because those people have credibility, right? Because they have this, this acronym. They have a lot of power for damage. Yes. They, oh. have, a, they have an acronym after their name and, or this experience or lots of certifications, and then they, and they want to go so deep on the science that you take a person like this, yeah. who might hear Just our- Confuse everybody. That's right. And then hear our message and then hear them try and tout a study that counters that message. And then they dismiss it completely and then go back to doing their cardio. And it's like, dude, you know how many people you lose trying to be the smarter trainer, fighting with another trainer and, and put them down because you have more of an education when really the message that you're presenting is only going to convolute everything and make it even you're, worse for everybody. One of the, the biggest um, yep. downfalls of the highly educated or intelligent is their arrogance, right? I'm so educated that I assume I know the right. answer. So everything's absolute. Right. And now, now the, they're, 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 I guess their benefit um, is that they do have a lot of information. Now, to somebody who's a beginner and doesn't know anything, they is, they already know that they don't know anything. Right. So they're open-minded. Of yeah. course, their detriment is they don't know anything. But they know that they don't. So they tend to be more open-minded. Yep. This is why um, if you talk to <coughs> martial arts experts, they will tell you it is much easier to teach somebody how to throw a punch or a kick who's never learned than it is to teach someone who's learned how to throw a pinch, uh, throw a punch or a kick you have wrong to unlearn, for years. Yeah, bad patterns. Or golf. You yeah. talk to a golfing instructor, and they'll yeah. say, if you've been golfing for years and doing it wrong for years, it's harder to teach you how to do it right than somebody who knows nothing. Yep. It's this pattern that you've developed. It's you, and it's hard to to go back. And so, I, this was my struggle with really educated trainers when I would hire them. It wasn't that they weren't smart; they obviously were. It wasn't that they weren't hardworking; they obviously were. It's that they were not as open minded. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, no, I already know the answer. It's like, you don't, you've never trained anybody. You've never worked for, you haven't done this for 10 years. So you don't know every, everything, you know, some stuff, but you don't know everything because you're not open-minded. You're not going to succeed. And in fact, I hate to say this. I really hate to say this, but it's fucking true. Talk to any fitness manager or general manager <coughs> who tends to be the most successful trainers in their gyms. And it tends to not it's be never the, the most, most likable one. It's, it's never the most educated. It's trainer. so never. shitty to say, but it's it true. Did that for ten I years. Know. I've had at least a hundred different trainers one. work for yeah. me at all levels of education, all the way up to a PhD. And I'll tell you right now, the most successful ones never were my most educated. I, know. I yeah. love my most educated, and I found later on in my career. You know how I, you know how I found so, them. I, I bet you did the same thing I did. Where I found the most value in my PhD, it was so perfect because they liked hearing themselves talk so much and they want to be smart. <laughs> you did exactly what I did. So I would have them teach my less educated yes, trainers yes. and I would pay them. So help I would them, pay them. Help them tutor with yeah. certifications. That's right. I would, I, take, I would take my budget and, and I remember doing this before. It was it, like, I didn't have approval with our district to do this. I just figured it out. I was like, oh my God, here's this hack. Like if I can get all these trainers yeah, sorted up, they're all going to be a little bit smarter. They're all going to get paid more. So they're all likely to stay longer and be better <laughs> trainers. Yeah. And these trainers that love being the ones that are most right and the smartest and have all these certs and have these degrees, it's like they're okay with their clients, but they're even better at teaching the trainers. And so it was like just – so I would take these uneducated trainers, have the, the really educated ones teach them, and then – but at, at the end result, the ones that were less educated, they got the experience from the trainer. They blew away, mm -hmm. blew away the ones that were – because those ones were so hung up on being right. It's so funny because the, the fitness attracts really insecure people. You either get the body image insecure – that I like, like us, I was really insecure yeah. about being skinny and stuff like that. And so I had, I had body, a little bit of body dysmorphia. That's what drove me to lift weights or you get the insecure. I'm not smart enough. So I got to go, I'm super educated. I'm like all the sort I have every certification. I went through all the degrees. Like I'm always talking about studies. Like, so you have like, and then sometimes you get a blend of both, but it's like, it breeds this, these it attracts, it's a bias. It's it a, is. It's a self-selection bias. It very much so. It attracts very, very insecure fitness people. It's like politics. Politics is that self-selection bias for power, power hungry narcissists. Mm -hmm. You're just yeah. going to attract a lot more of them because of the, of the position. Today's program giveaway is maps strong. If you want to win that, you got to do this. Leave a comment below this video. The first 24 hours that we drop it, subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. We also got a sale going on this month. MAPS Resistance. This is a beginner strength training program. It's half off. And then MAPS Prime Pro. This is so valuable for trainers and coaches. 
And for those of you that want to alleviate pain and improve mobility, that's also 50% off. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Now, I had a, I don't know, I just thought of this. I had a, a friend, uh, well, I read a study, a study, a study, excuse me, a story, and I knew somebody who knew this guy. I can't remember his name, but he was a top wrestler, and he was super arrogant because everybody he would go against, he'd beat. So mm. he's like, oh, I'm one of the best. I'm one of the best. I beat everybody, whatever. He went to Senegal because have you guys ever seen uh, wrestling in Senegal? Have you ever seen these guys? Mm -mm. I don't know. Maybe Doug, you can look them up. I think I've shown you guys this. This before. isn't the one where they like slap each other. No, that's that weird sport in India. Is you seen that? What is that? Have like, you seen that? And then they like jump and <laughs> bro, they jump in the and literally just smack each other in the chest. It doesn't make any sense. But How do I you love win? Watching it, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. They just like slap they'll the jump as high as they can, and just slap yeah. each other. Uh. Anyway, in Senegal, they have this long tradition of wrestling. And I, I mean, you're talking about like, uh, it looks like stadiums full of people watching these dudes and they're, they're monsters. So he went there. I don't remember. I don't, so I, again, I read this story and this guy's like, yeah, I know that guy. It's true. He went there and he's like a badass wrestler and he got crushed and he's, he became so humble. Like, okay, I need to learn from these guys because yeah, these guys are this guy. Oh, this guy I think actually became, yeah. he's in, he's in the WWE. Uh, these guys are monsters. You should watch some of the wrestling these guys do. <coughs> I don't think I've seen this before. Oh, they are beasts. Uh, like you, Doug, you might even be able to look up just clips of the wrestling uh, of some of these guys. They're, they're, yeah, right there. It's they're just absolute monsters. So yeah, he went over the guy's ass kicked, and he's like, oh okay, I guess I'm not <laughs> one of the best in the world. And then the, that Indian sport, what is that? <sighs> I don't know. Who what would, was your who point of bringing that up? The oh, but you just like, humble. You become oh, humble. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're so arrogant. Yeah, you know, yeah. you walk around thinking yeah. you're the you're the shit, and you have nothing to learn. Yeah, the worst part about it, though, when you get these the trainers that are at that level too, because I, I mean, I was this. This was happened to me, right? So I was I was promoted by the time I was 20 years old, the least experienced, least educated, Dang. and and just a year before that, I was everybody's peer. Now I'm your boss. Yeah. You're older, you're smarter, and you're more experienced. Imagine that da dynamic that I had mm -hmm. to deal with right mm -hmm. out the gates. Like, which I'm so blessed that I got put in that situation because boy, did I have to figure out how do I lead a bunch of people who have no respect for me? Yeah, you right. know what I'm saying? Who think they're smarter than me, think they're more and a lot of them, they're right. They were more educated, they were more experienced and some of that. But there was a reason. Just trial by there was fire. a reason why I got to that position at that and and I had to find a way to like, okay, which is why I leaned heavy into the business side because that's where I was strong. I was strong in my ability to scale and build a business. I wasn't going to get into an argument with my PhD trainer who's got 10 years of experience on me. It's like, and tell him how to train your clients better. It's like, he heaven forbid I do that. Yeah. But what I could do, because what they were terrible at was actually organizing, building, scaling, breaking down their business. And so I leaned heavy into that direction to support yeah, them. Yeah, but you know even what? then you were, you were not arrogant. Yeah. Oh, of course. You know, you're looking at people and trying to learn from them. It's such a superpower, by the yeah. way, to isn't, be able to do that. Isn't that a weird thing, though? Like, the you're more likely to be humbled in person, right? Like, when you're yeah. interacting with somebody uh, who actually knows something. and Because online, uh, people get this weird perception, like it's they're autonomous or they just have this it, they just become like a, a crazy narcissist yeah. out of nowhere and like it will try to back themselves up later by researching you know it, i don't know it's a weird dynamic because like beforehand we would just like resolve a lot of these things like oh you actually don't know what you're talking about and yeah. then they would be like oh no uh, like yeah. i'm exposed i can't pull up my phone nobody's getting exposed online yeah you know it's like you can hide behind Dude, all this fluff. Imagine how fucking weird it's going to be just because your point is right. I, you're, you're totally right. It, internet breeds this like this weird narcissism. Yeah, we're and stuff creating like that. more narcissists. And when you're in person, there's this, there's always this checks and balance because yeah. one, I could get punked. Like you could literally yeah. physically, you could beat me up if I say the wrong thing, possibly. Yep. Two, you don't, I, I don't get to say, hold on, let me go Google search yeah. and, and back my shit up and then go, yeah, I don't have that pause, right? So, but. I mean, when you think of things like future, like Neuralink, and when stuff, everybody like, knows all this, bro, stuff. like it's gonna, it's gonna cr bring the internet version, fucking troll yeah. person into real life. So you're gonna weird. have the access like that. Yeah, but everybody's gonna have it. I know, but that, that, that's why it's gonna be awful. It's gonna be weird. It's gonna you be know awful. What, you know, my real weird. my fear with that is that we might develop some kind of hive mind. You mm -hmm. know, if you look at the way like bees. And ants uh, and certain insects <coughs> uh, behave. Mm -hmm. um, it's like they're 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 of course because like everything, everything will be response. based off an algorithm. You'll be right 
if the data and information you present is just slightly the majority. Yeah. When in reality, there's an there's an individual variance to everything always. Always. And, but think of it this way, right? <clears throat> if I want to, and by the way, right now it's very powerful compared to how it was 20 years ago. But if I want to, let's say, scare the population. I would put out some articles on social media and that's very effective. It's very effective because it reaches a lot of people. Mm -hmm. What if we could hit a button and everybody received that instantly? Yeah. Now you've got instant reaction yeah, yeah. right away. It's hive mind. Yeah. So the control with that will be. I mean, it's the reason why I, mm -hmm. I like, obviously you've been listening a long time. You've heard me say it a bunch of times. I'm going to keep saying it. Plugged I, and unplugged. That's right. You want to you want to start the start the I the do, rebellion? Yeah, I will be the unplugged for sure. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? Same. Like I really believe that that will be, and you'll it'll be a choice. I think people will choose. The to, unplugged will be like we're not genetically perfect because everybody else is like modified, right? <laughs> we have like right. we we're don't gonna have, have like flaws. perfect teeth. Yeah, exactly. We don't jump 15 feet in the air and yeah, whatever. Yeah. And yeah. Like, you know why did you choose that? Why would you want to be that way? Yeah, when yeah. You could just be perfect. No, it, I it real. Wow. I think it'll separate society that way, and I think there's gonna be. Dude. And I think you already see a bit of that. I just think that it's it's interesting to see. You know, I, I think as Katrina and I were sharing like old stories of like, it's so funny, of, of all the things her and I are talking about the last day before we see each other, we're talking about dating other people and things like that and people we hooked up with in the past. And, <laughs> wow. Yeah. We were, we were talking just about this. to get it all out yeah, there. I, well, it was about yeah. flying and she was actually telling a funny story like the first time she ever flew to Vegas to come see me and the girl she was sitting next to on the plane happened to have hooked up with me and like, it was like- What? Oh. Yeah. It was like- how I know that yeah yeah how did so, she find out well they they knew they knew each other they were friends and knew each other she wasn't flying there to see you too was she no no she wasn't, no, she wasn't, no, she wasn't, no, she wasn't. wait it was like him friday when you see him yeah saturday yeah. Yeah. so we were we were talking about that and so like we actually we schedule. knew that story right of course because that was a long time ago in our relationship and that girl was like five eight years before her and it was not even a big deal right right but it brought her, we were, and that story came up and I, and I never really told her all about like how we met and like how I, what I thought about her and stuff like that. Cause I didn't think it was necessary. And so we were talking about, it. I was like, you know, you know, the, the thing that stands out most about that girl more than anything else, the any girl I ever dated, I said, we, we dated or we were talking for about a month or so during the rise of texting. It hadn't mm -hmm. been a thing yet. Right. It was like, so this is right after the analog type phones yeah. and you, now the blackberries the, the side yeah like and it was the first girl i'd ever like hung out with brought her back to my house and we're hanging out like watching tv talking to them. it was just her and i right in my condo and like like mid conversation i'd be talking to her and like she'd be on her phone and i remember like so being so like oh my god this is disrespectful yeah i'd never experienced that and, and i never seen that before at that mm -hmm. point it was like so early on and people doing that, having that behavior. And I remember telling Katrina, I was just like, oh my, I was so turned off by her because it was like so unattractive for this girl to be talking to me. Distractive. Yeah. And like talking to somebody else on the phone at the same time. Yeah. And she was like, no big deal about it. And I remember like giving her a second chance, like hanging out with her a second time. And the same thing again, yeah. I'm like, who is this bitch? Like, yeah. fucking <laughs> Now you're at like a nice dinner and uh, you could see somebody just break out in like a TikTok booty dance, like as you're like <laughs> eating steak, like it just happens yeah. there near Film the fountain. Me. Yeah. Oh, I mean, God. it's become the norm now, right? Like that's not, that would not be that weird. God, it does breed narcissism, doesn't it? It's, it's insane, dude. Yeah. It's everywhere. Isn't that the story of the guy that looked into the reflecting um, it's like, it's a pool of lake or yeah. whatever, and then he fa falls Fell in, in his own image and, and then drowns. drowns. Yeah. yeah, that's the story. That's, that's what is that from? That's a is great like analogy. Aesop's fable thing. No, what is that? No, it's a it's a it's a, it's a, it's a I think it's a Greek. Is it a Greek legend or I, myth? Yeah, I, I think that's where the word comes from. Oh. The guy's name was something narcissist. So, so Jonathan yeah. Pajau. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah oh, interesting. Nar narcissist. Yeah, so Jonathan Pajau, who breaks down symbolism, and he's fucking brilliant. He uh, talks about I love this. it, yeah. And he talks about the lessons in these stories and how they're, it's just ancient wisdom. Mm -hmm. And he talks about this black, you know, this mirror that you look into that reflects into you, like how beautiful you are and how you can drown in it. And he's talking about the phone. He's talking about the phone. He actually like is redoing Snow White. And, yeah. uh, and so instead of like the mirror on the wall, he has it. So it's like a, like the, the hand version of it. So she's actually looking at it just like she'd be looking at yes. uh, it's, her phone. It's, cr to, it's crazy to think when you think back to like old wisdom this is like that, human behavior how, doesn't exactly, change. It's we we are so not that different nope. today. Nope. As much as we want to believe, like oh, we're way smarter, we got way more, we're nothing no. like we were two hundred no. years ago. Same problems. Like 
they are the exact same problems. They've mm -hmm. just manifested and they have different mediums. Yep. Yeah. But it's yep. exact same shit yep. that we were struggling with 200 years ago. Well, you yeah. know, shows you how dumb we are. And it's so funny because like the <laughs> whole thing with like, if you go in the religious route of like idols and people that like, you know, you build these like statues or you follow these people that are like, you know, they, they take you away from your worship. It's like, you see that with celebrities, you see that yes. with like famous like sports athletes and stars and like, and we just get pulled so hard in like these directions or like your Taylor Swifties and like, it's, it's like a cult of its own, you know, and you, it's, it's interesting. Like that whole dynamic never changed. Like it just, uh, created like a new Speaking form. Speaking of an annoying dynamic, I sent it to the group. If you could, I don't know if you could pull it up. It's a link to, um, X or Twitter. I don't know if they still, they call it X. You got to watch this. Um, What's his name from All In Podcast? Who's the Shamoth, moderator? No. David Sachs. No, the moderator. Oh, D oh, uh, Jason. Jason. Yeah, Jason Calcanis. shared this. And he posted like, uh, so I want you guys to watch this girl and listen to her. Oh, talk. I saw it. I saw this. And you did posted. see this? It's everyone sending this. It's the girl who's talking about her work week. Oh, it's gone oh, viral. Everyone's, I can't. I I've can't, seen so many people break it down. Is she uh, Listen. Was she complaining about it oh, or something? Oh, bro! Yeah, yeah you yeah. gotta watch. You gotta yeah, watch it. Uh, I want Doug to pull. It's it gone up. viral. It's yeah, like I've, I've seen it. like I've seen at least ten like big pages. Oh, like, and and I want to talk about what happened online with it. Okay, listen yeah, to yeah, this. Yeah, this is it. Yeah, yeah. Listen to this girl. It's the most annoying thing you've ever heard in your life. Oh God, I don't want to listen to this. I know I'm probably just being so dramatic and annoying, but this is my first job, like my first nine to five job after college, and I'm in person, and I'm commuting in the city, and it takes me fucking forever to get there. There's no way I'm going to be able to afford living oh. in the city right now, so that's oh. off the table. Like, fucking duh! If I was able to walk to work, and it w it'd be fine, but I'm not, so it literally takes me, like, I leave here, like, I get on the train at 7.30, and I don't get home till, like, 6.15 earliest, and then, um, like, I don't have time to do anything. I don't, I, I want to shower, eat like my torture, dinner, and go to sleep. You know? I don't have okay. time or energy to so hard. cook my dinner either. Like, I yeah, don't so, have it. Yeah, so, I, see, I saw it, so we could talk about so it. So he, oh. he's, like, making fun of her, like, okay, princess, like, relax, right? Yeah, so yeah. first job out of college, single girl. She has to commute Wait. to work and leave a house at 7.30. Oh, she gets back at 6.15. She mm. gets, you know, she works five days a week. She's talking about how she has no time. It's the most terrible thing in the world. Now, what's funny about this, so I saw this and I thought to myself, oh, everybody's going to think this is ridiculous. Like, shut your face. Like, you like, this is the definition of a big baby, okay? Yeah. Uh, now, I get you have feelings. That's fine. But when you have feelings and they rule you like this, like, you got to work on that. Here's where I, I, this, this is the surprise. So many people reposting it and defending her. Oh, well, yeah, really? I haven't yes. seen that. I saw all the, I saw, well, obviously. Yeah, well, I yes, a, working. I have a bias because I have the pages that I know, dude. It's like, oh yes, working 40 hours a week is hard. You guys stop making fun of her. It's not the way humans should live. It, you know, nobody likes to commute. It's really tough and this and that. And I'm like, what is happening? Yeah. What's happening? Just well, we're on our babies. way. We're on our way. A lot of these companies are, are jumping back to a four day work week, right? I think uh, a few of them have already transitioned into that now. So. It's just crazy to me because, first of all, you don't have kids. You're single. You get home at 6.15, you get the weekends off. This is your first job. I mean, the you're, truth- Not only are you crying about it, which, okay, fine. You're sad about it. It's hard. Maybe it's new. It's new to you. It's challenging. Every step is challenging. I get that. But then you make a video crying yeah. into the camera yeah. and you post it about how tough well, your so life that, is. That's the part that I- Okay, the part that you do that- Because here's the thing. We're all guilty of at one point in our life saying today was hard or it was a rough Everybody, week, yeah. right? Which, well, which just now you get which by the way, the attention. generation before us would be like this pussy sure. yeah. said it was a hard day because sure. he worked ten hours for five days okay. in a row. Yeah. Your dad did, you know what I'm saying? And so what you just did there is sarcasm. <laughs> which you do not see amongst a lot of the youth anymore. Yeah, you know? <laughs> like you, like I'm sorry, like they need to be checked. Yeah, you know, like yep. they need well, good friends that are be like you're being a little baby right now, like fucking. Like, well, that's just it. It's like that, that's the part, the, the level of narcissism, and that's crazy. Is that you? She, she filmed it. Yeah, you filmed it, and she's crying. Yeah. And she's talking Stop about how hard so her life weak. is and all that stuff. She's literally asking to be, you know, ridiculed, and it's just. And then people def the uh, defender, like, oh man, listen. I mean, do you guys? It's your first job out of college. Yeah, dude. Do you, you guys, got a job. Do you guys subscribe to that? Give me a break. Uh, what is the the you know good times make weak men, weak men mm -hmm. make uh, hard times, hard times, hard, hard times, times make strong men, strong yeah, men. Yes. 
Hundred percent. I mean, it's, by the way, we're, when we're I, on the peak of the week, but, yeah. <laughs> listen, <laughs> it's gonna shift back to hard. Listen, and everybody's fucked. Look, yes, I've definitely you know come home and I'm tired. Oh my god, I work so hard. This and that. And I've had this happen where my dad will be like, you know, when I was younger, when I was working in the gyms, okay, when I was managing gyms. And now, by the way, forty hours a week. This girl's complaining about. I wish I worked forty hours a week when I used to manage gyms. I was no, in no, there it was bell to bell. Yeah, it was, was nine a.m. to nine or ten p.m. Six or seven, seven days, days a week. A week. Yeah. Okay. Usually I did seven you days a week. You had to do for, seven so, most of the time. I did it for a year. Yeah. A year straight. I didn't miss a day. Yeah. Now I would tell my dad, my dad's like, what's the matter? I'm like, oh, I'm so tired. What do you mean? I'm at work at nine. I come home at nine o'clock. I haven't taken a day off. And I remember my dad being like, yeah, that's a lot of hours. He goes, but you're in the, like, what are you doing in the gym? You're walking around, you're talking to people, you're having fun with your friends, you know? And I remember him saying that and me looking at him, knowing where he came from and what he still did. Yeah. And it worked. I was like, you know, and it's not that I invalidated myself. Like, right. oh, I shouldn't, you know, it was more like. I could do this. Let me reframe this a little bit. Yeah, yeah, like maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just being a baby yeah, right now. Could be worse. I could be doing pouring cement and then coming back and sleeping with my two brothers and sisters in one bed. Oh. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or on the floor, yeah. right? My dad, you, for, you know how long he did this? He would work from 5 a.m. to 2 p.m., come home, sleep on the couch, go back to work. Because he had to double, he had to work twice as much to start. This is how we started. He'd work from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m., come back home, go to bed, and repeat. This is what he did for a long time. Mm. So, yeah, I get it. Like, there, I get I get that it's hard for you. And there's all that stuff. there's geez, people, man. though, I'm is because I, I probably rail on the millennials the most out of all of us. I'm gonna, She's not a millennial, though. She's too young. Gen Z. I don't know what that is. Yeah, yeah, is that Gen Z? Whatever the next one. I think so. Is it Gen Z? What's after Z, anyway? Um. I don't know. Nothing. Z's the last letter. Oh, oh, sure. we, we, we start over. Numbers. We start over. There, there. So there is, a, there is a hustle culture happening though between. Yes. Uh, so, you know, it's really common, and over here where we're at is um, dual jobs, three jobs. Mm. There's a lot of people because of the so many companies give you the flexibility to work from home. That I know a lot of people that are actually a lot. Yeah. I know a handful of people that are actually you. running two and three jobs. Yeah. Making good ass money because they're they got like people three, that actually want to work. There's yeah, three seventy so k a year jobs yeah. that they're that they're maintaining by just managing their when they have their meetings around the other meetings and running three different. I wonder what in. that looks like in term because like after COVID and everything, like it just seems like the the want to work just really dropped off in, in terms of coming back and showing yeah. up and. Uh, in terms of like there being opportunity versus it just being a uh, trying to figure out how to just you know get by without having to go the extra bit. Well, we have some weird times ahead right now because Bro, you, you, you see all the strikes that are happening. Yeah, strikes are happening yeah. all over the place right now. Right, you had the you had the UPS, you had the nurses, you have my buddy just text me, hey, and because he, his district, the teachers over in Fresno, Fresno, Fremont, over that direction. Yeah, they went on strike. They are on strike now. Like so. You got a lot, of, a lot of these people that have worked during this the the COVID times, busting their tail. Inflation's been running, and they haven't seen it. It's an so increase. funny you just said that. I yeah. literally um, had our team post, or, or they're going to post this meme on my Instagram page. It's a, it's a just a funny meme, but it says New York elevator operators in 1945 going on strike. This actually happened. Okay, what it did is it caused a mass adoption of automatic elevators, mm -hmm. eventually making their jobs obsolete. Now. What people need to realize about that is automatic elevators would have happened anyway, mm -hmm. but what you did is made it happen a lot faster. It. Yeah. And you over, you overestimated your value. Oh, that's like when people overestimate their value things, this is when the ego becomes so big that you just think you're so important. I feel like anybody who didn't build a company naturally does that. It's, and I yeah. was, I'm guilty of this, right? I'm guilt. I remember when their perspective I, is, I was really so, I was accurate. so offended, which was, what was crazy to me. And here's what's so hard. And so I get it. I understand why people do this. I, you, when you, when you run a club, you, your main job is to manage P and L's, right? So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm competing against whoever ran that, that gym before me. And I saw, I can see his or her numbers and what they did. And then I see how I impact it. And it, I'm impacting it by a half a million or a million dollars a year. That's yeah. a lot of money. And I'm only making 120, you know what I'm saying? And so 
man, I'm very, very valuable in my eyes. Like I'm, I'm five X valuable to what you pay me. So getting a 20, you should give me at least a 20 grand increase or something. Right. So in your head, you think that, or they would never let you go. They, they, they knew you were leaving. They'd come back and be mm -hmm. like, Oh, we'll give you double just to stay. Mm -hmm. And no, man, when I left, don't let the door hit you on the way out. 10 <laughs> years of <laughs> fucking breaking yeah, records yeah, and being yeah. awesome. You thought they were going to cry. But I think the, yeah. for me, it was a real growing up phase of my life, right? My late twenties of going through this process because I, what I recognize and what I definitely realize now having experience of building multiple companies is, you know, your perspective when you're, when you're a, a key piece to that, like as far as helping the company is one thing. It's a whole nother thing to be the person who took it from zero mm -hmm. and built it into something like that. And though the, and the minds, the effort, the work and stuff like that, like you're an important cog but you're also a replaceable cog, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And, and as, as valuable as I thought I was and how important I thought I was, it's like, even the business, even if the business lost $200,000 a year, cause I'm no longer there. It doesn't matter. It's like it's saying, keep going. It's like you know? saying the general, goes it's, on. it's like saying generals in war, a general, Oh, it's the soldiers. And it's true. The soldiers are out there doing it, but the general is directing what's happening. And yeah. this is what Strategy. makes some, yes. And so it's all valuable, but when you overestimate your value, you ran into problems. I could not be employed Dude. for too long because I understood this. Uh, and and I, 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 I'm pretty, I thank my parents for this. Now it's not like they sat me down and taught me this, mm -hmm. but because of where my parents came from, uh, I understood this right away. So I worked, I, I worked corporate fitness for a few years. And when things were, when I was looking at things and they weren't the way I wanted and they weren't responding to me the way I wanted them to, I knew like, okay, what's my power? I'm going to quit. What are they going to do? Cry? They're going to close the gyms down? No, they're going to keep going. Yeah. And so I either need to stop complaining or I need to leave and do my own thing. And that's what I did. I yeah. left and did my own thing. And that was it. Dude, Never back. Speaking of like uh, overestimating or underestimating, like, so I was actually looking into um, uh, Everett has, he, he's going to be Saruman for Halloween. And so I was looking at the actor who played him uh, and read up and I was like, insanely impressed with this guy's like background like his the history of what he's done like he's played so many different characters like the golden <coughs> uh in ah the the man with the golden gun in like 007 he's, oh crap he's he been was. count dooku he's been like like a good a whole host of like Wasn't all he these actors yeah yeah and and he also was um like an intelligence officer for the royal air force and did like real like in i don't know if it's world war ii but like later on but he definitely was a uh has like a, a whole host of like military like spy type of of resume for him. he's like the real life like 007 and he's just this it's crazy also he uh is like an opera singer and had a metal band okay that's not fair anymore yeah and it's like a sick metal band i'm like who is this so anyway, I had, I had no idea. And like, there's just people like that are just walking among us. And you're like, dude, this guy is insane. You, you ever meet someone like that in person you're, where you meet someone in person and you already respect it. So I had a, I, yeah. had, a, I had a client who was a, he was a surgeon and he was well-respected surgeon. So he was like a very smart, badass, very well-known kind of guy. And then I get to know him and, uh, oh, 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 you played D one football. Well, okay. Jesus Christ. All right. Smart and super athletic back in the day. That's, that's pretty cool. And then I get to know him a little better. Oh, you know, what do you like to do for fun? Oh, I'm a classically trained pianist. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Wait, wait, wait. You you actually had the time Wouldn't to go. Wouldn't even told you otherwise, but just does that Yeah. For fun. Oh, wow. Yeah. You had the time to do that? That's crazy. And then I found out, oh, you 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 went you and You know learned. three languages? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no. Oh, the language people. Yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, oh God. Yeah. Oh, oh, you also went and got uh, and learned physics for fun. Yeah. It's not even, it has nothing to do with your field, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but you went and got a degree. Yeah. I remember I, was, I would talk to this guy and I was like, all right, bro. I have, you know, I have a cousin like that. I have a little cousin who is- Gifted like that? He's just one of the most special people I've ever met in my entire right. life. So he's a young kid. He's, you know, he's young teen. He, he plays uh, multiple instruments. On his own, he goes to um, care homes with elderly. So how many 14-year-olds know that you know- this is what they want to do. Yeah, they want yeah. to go yeah. and play music for older people oh, cool. and talk with them. He's uh, in the family. If there's ever a problem, he'll come to you, talk. Like He's so wise. Wow. Like, Where's yeah. this kid come from? Gets hella good grades on his, for fun, his other hobbies are horticulture. Um, he's, he's constructing a muscle car. 
Oh. Um, and, wow. and he understands how to weld and do all the stuff. Wow. At yeah, 14? Dude. Dang. Bro, I... I, every time I talk, he needs to, to have like a whole like busload of kids. You know? Oh, we're we're like we gotta like he's devoutly turn this upside down. He's devoutly Catholic, but what I mean by that is like in a genuine way, where he's like um, just kind. Like he would doesn't come up to you and preach, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you meet him, and he's like, fourteen year olds. We're always all fourteen year olds have. Yes, yeah, mom and dad get a, should get a award, bro. Oh yeah, God! Yeah. Like, well, I know. I'm, I talk. That to doesn't magically just happen, dude. Hit my that's aunt. Sure. I tell that's good parents. I tell my aunt, yeah. uncle all the time. I'm like this kid. I don't. He's yeah, no, the most that's, special. But to me, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great reflection life. of of a parent oh, right there that's it's, done a really good job. It's crazy. You know, back to the. Uh, I didn't want to leave the conversation around the technology. You brought up something that it was on my list of things I wanted to bring up. Anyways, talking about the. Uh, Elevator operators, like basically, yeah. you know, making the mistake of overvaluing themselves. And then all they did was force the hand of the the business owners to push technology to, you know, replace them, replace them. Yeah. So have you guys seen uh, the AI tool that's used in Starbucks? I, I don't know if all of them, I don't think all of them are doing this because I try to Google it right now to see if I could find other ones. I actually couldn't find it, but I saw this already. The AI tool on the camera of the Star Starbucks uh, baristas. No. So is it oh. like facial recognition? Or? No, you no. sent it. Yeah, I think I did send it to you guys. Oh, this is messed up. No, Dude, I don't know. So what it does, okay, so the oh. you know the, the cameras in Starbucks can see everything, right? So people theft or anything like that, so it, that's normal. But this AI tool is designed to track the employees and how many cups they serve. Their productivity. Their productivity. Wow. And it's like so, like it's so alarming. You could see like in like two hours time, Sarah did three cups. Tommy did 22 cups. <laughs> Susan did 17 yeah. cups. Yeah. So like imagine being able to to manage your staff that way and be like, be like Johnny. raise raise for yeah, raise for Johnny, Susan fired, you know, and then get your production up, Karen. Like I mean, how crazy is that? You know what's interesting wow. about that, Adam? Uh, and imagine that tool in almost any work work totally. You know, to be yeah. able to measure now, uh, You know what's interesting the about that? manager AI. You know what's interesting about that is I could see managers make mistakes with that. Of course. Yeah. yeah, and what I mean by that is they that's what they value. Yeah, they'll just value that. Although Susan might only make 3 cups. Yeah. Man, the customers, customers love her. Customers aren't coming back. The staff loves yes. her. So here's, everybody's like so she's I think it would be awesome cuz and I've shared with you guys before. The most impactful book I ever read, it's a day read. It's one minute manager yeah. and it shifted the way that I led and, ha and I wish I found that book earlier in my career. And the secret to that was actually not looking at the people that were doing shitty and underperforming, but making sure you pointed out Tommy, who's doing 22 cups yeah. and, and praising and recognizing him in front of his peers in public. And, and, and giving yeah. him that yeah. would motivate the other ones to want to step up. And then of course there's going to be shit butts or that aren't going to do anything. And those are the ones you need to weed out anyways. But most people see that they they seek that they want that we'll, type we'll of elevate their game and it yeah. elevates them versus yeah. which is what it, and to your point what most shitty managers will do because we don't do a good job of teaching leaders to be leaders is we go over and be like susan you're only doing three yeah. cups if you keep that up you're going to be fired you need to be more like tommy who does 20 cups oh, yeah. which is the wrong way to do it the right way to do it would be to go praise tommy this is and recognize him one of the first lessons i learned uh, as a manager from my mentor was you praise in public, you reprimand in private. Yeah. Shitty managers literally always do the do opposite. opposite. Anybody right. watching this who has a shitty boss will tell you, oh yeah, they'll in in a meeting, they'll they'll talk down to somebody. And then when they do something well, it's in private. Hey, I want you to let you know hey. you did a really good job. It's not nearly as impactful. It's about it's all about the peers. By mm -hmm. the way, here's a little hack for managers. And you don't have to spend as much money getting them a gift or whatever because all you got to do is say that they did a good job among their peers. They value that way more than yeah. a $50 gift card to Starbucks that you give them privately. That's not nearly as important or yeah. impactful. So anyway, people yeah. watching right now are probably wondering why I look so comfortable. Um, <laughs> but we're, we're about yeah, to get on a plane, but I, you know, we talk a lot about Viore's, uh, like nice looking athleisure wear, the kind you go out with. Yeah. We don't talk enough about their athleisure wear that is like just Com comfortable. So just, you're wearing like this, is just what are the ones Doug you and I always wear because I pack those like in my carry on the really thin yes. nice ones because I'm gonna sweats. switch into those yeah I'm not sure the name of these but they're super yeah you're wearing them right now you're wearing them right now too they're not the, these are comfortable you're wearing oh. right now but I packed my legs are I literally packed right those now. in my carry on mm. so I can actually switch into them and like we don't talk enough about it because we we you know typically we're on the show we go out and do things so I always wear the nicer like you know stuff you want to go out in Viore. But at home, I have so much of the like, oh man, you put on this stuff and you just you just feel so nice. They have why, some really cool. Look them up, Doug, and see if you can find which ones those are while we're, while we're talking. 
But, you know, also why we're talking about partners and you're talking about trainers and being better leaders and stuff like that, oh. you know, in, in CI, this is one of the things, uh, you know, why I really, really appreciate the work that Jason Phillips is doing with the coaches and trainers out there because they do this. Yeah, they do this. They do a really good job. And I love that. So <clears throat> we get the opportunity to meet with uh, quite a few of them every week or biweekly um, on our, our Wednesday calls. And, you know, you got all these other fitness leaders and these are the type of conversations that we have about leading their team, uh, talking to your client, leading your clients, which is all the, all this stuff. And sure, like, yep. even like the early conversation that we were talking about, not being that trainer who's, you know, over educating your client where you're losing them in the weeds, just touting studies, like giving them, knowing what your desired outcome is and to like the application they process. They teach you how to coach. Yeah. That's, there's a very big difference between under, learning information that's pertinent to coaching. That's important too. And then learning how to coach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two very different things. NCI doesn't Well, both. because what we always have to remember is, and I love like, uh, I remember this was one of the first big lessons I got from my mentor was like desired outcome. And he would like, he would always challenge me that way, no matter what, like if I was frustrated with a, with a staff member, like someone who worked for me and I was like, ah, oh, ready to fire him, I'd call him up. And I always, always before I did anything like, R like rash or quick, I would call him up and just invent to him. And he'd always let me go. And then the next thing he'd say, he'd say, well, what's your desired outcome? And I'd be like, ah, what do you mean? I'm like, well, what do you, what do you want to come from this? What is your, what would be the perfect before situation? Before he gives you advice, right? Yeah. Before he gives me advice. He said, what, what do you want to happen? And then I'd have to really think about that. Like, cause emotionally I'm like, I want to fire him. You know what I'm yeah, saying? I mean, but then I also know that I got to hire someone else to replace that. I'm going to have to take on all those clients. Yeah, yeah, you know what I'm saying? All the downstream effects. And he's like, okay, yeah. I mean, if that's what you want to do, then go fire the fucker. You know what I'm saying? They did this, they did that, they deserve that. Or do you just want them to be, do you want them to be a better trainer? So, well, yeah, of course I want them to be better at their job. Okay, well then, do you think that going and lighting them up over this is the best path to that? And I thought, okay, you're right, it's not. And I love that because I've applied that in my relationship, in yeah. life, right? With my yeah. relationships with my, my peers, my relationship with my wife. Like we get, we act so emotionally and we want to react to things. And if you can just pause for a second, go, okay, what is my true desired outcome? Yeah. And a lot of times when you're, especially when you're talking about your spouse and stuff like that, you're like, well, I really want my husband to put, pick his clothes up off the floor. Okay. Well, if going over there and pointing it out yeah. and scolding him, do you think that's going to get your desired outcome? Or do you think there's a better way to do it? That's well, right. what is the best way to possibly do it? Think about that. Like, I mean, that, that tool is Jordan like, Peterson says, like, um, he talks about marriage and he says, do you want to win or do you want to like work together? And he's like, cause sometimes you win and you end up, yeah, you won. Good job. You ever seen those memes with the guy, <coughs> he's sleeping outside on a mattress, like out in the driveway. And he's like, I finally won an argument with my wife. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's like, is yeah, it worth yeah, it? Though? Yeah, like, did you really win? You won, but now what? Like now yeah, you guys yeah. hate each other. What is it called? Oh, there? those are all them. So I have the, what's that? I say fleet, fleet, fleet joggers, joggers. And there's yeah. also the core jogger. I think the core, I think you have the the core, the joggers. core. yeah yeah the they're fleet. good dude they're all so, I mean they're so lightweight yeah. and comfortable dude I, got, I there's not the I I can't you guys know I don't I don't sleep with any clothes when I sleep those those pants are so comfortable I could sleep in those that's pants. why you're bringing them because you're sure <laughs> oh you're not sharing a room now you can sleep naked yeah I thought you're gonna share a room yeah. oh finally yeah. I can sleep in my pod dude. Justin that's puts that's why he wears an eye mask by the way like, I, I don't want to see yeah, Adam pillow over it everything everything lock it out dude you got you just reminded me of something I just read something and I. Tried to verify it was true. I think it's real. I think it's real <laughs> because uh, I did verify it, but I'm, I'm, I am I'm can't believe it. I can't believe it. So listen to this. You ready for this? Yeah. We were just talking about how like these whiny babies and this and that and how mm. kid, like, you know, like these, these generations, each generation gets whatever crazier. Yeah. If this doesn't like define the insanity, I don't know what does. Students at the University of Augsburg, this is in Germany have called for, ready for this, handicap accessible glory holes. I saw that. Is that be real? installed on the campus. That's not Citing real. diversification. The students argued that having spaces for anonymous sex would ensure the safety Wait. of queer students. I don't know why this is a queer. Handicap? Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, glory so. Glory holes? Yeah, which, all, which begs the question, do they already have glory holes? Like, yeah, are there glory exactly. holes, but just not handy? Like, wait, <laughs> I can't reach like, this one. You can't just wheel up to it. I yeah, guess. and then they have a picture of 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 one of them, and it's like a professionally made. I, this is I can't believe this. It's not it's not like a glory joke. Hole. Did you did you make sure you did your uh, Snopes or whatever? I, Snoops or Snopes you know what, Doug? Look this up, please, because because yeah, you could be getting if this trolled. is real. 
uh, that theory well, aren't that you, we're in an so alternate I, universe If is I true. read something uh, online, yeah. like, even that AI thing, like I right away go try and fact check because it's like nothing is. It's it's like a 50-50 shot now. This is this can't be real. Is not is I'm, not true. I, I hope it's not real. If it's not real, I'll be happy. It's uh, so the University of A U G S B U R G, and then put. Um, Handicap accessible glory holes, <laughs> and then, and then the click on images, Doug. No, no, more no. glory holes. <laughs> no, don't do that. I mean, it seems like it might be real. Fuck. <sighs> what? Are you really serious? Yeah. We have broken the simulation for sure. So, what? Well, okay. <sighs> like, okay, maybe you're just a weirdo or you, whatever. You got your weird kink or whatever. Fine. Keep it yeah. yourself. But enough of these students got together and they said, let's go tell the administration. Let's go bring this up Yeah. with the school. Well, and let's- Fight for it. Welcome. Here's your glory hole. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew, hey, Andrew, is your mic on over there or no? Are you off? What's uh, do you uh, do you watch? Are you into soccer at all or no? Do you are you paying attention to like Messi and everything like that coming over? Did you guys? Did I, I tell you guys already to watch that that uh, little docu series on him? Yeah, you did. It's I mean, it's really good. You got me like as far as David Beckham. Like, did you watch that one? Yeah, yeah, I watched. It, it was good, wasn't it? Liked it a lot. The you know what's happening? Right so now. you know that he's becoming. Are you a trying fan? to pull me into the soccer? Dude, world? I, like, I I'm, I'm resistant of it. Trust yeah. me, I really am. But, but it's they, happening. But it's slowly happening. Like you know, and I, I'm at least curious. <laughs> the David Beckham thing. Good. We have a huge really international good. audience. I, I, so you I know, you know that you know that he 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 you know he started the Florida team, right? Yes. And you know his big pull was he went and got Messi. So now Messi, oh, the best soccer player in the world, wow. now plays in the U.S. Wow. Okay, for Florida for David Beckham. Wow. So you should watch. You should, okay. you should watch this stuff. The reason why I'm bringing up Messi though has nothing to do with actually soccer. Is did you see his car that he just bought? Look up Messi's new family car to travel. So M E S S I. Is it Messi? A is that how no, you pronounce oh, it? Or Messi? No, it's I, Messi. I think it's Messi. Uh, that's how I've always heard it. Yeah. Oh, I always um, heard Messi. A. No. I mean, depends where you're in the world. You're you trying to be fancy. Tell me if you can. Uh, did you see it? Doug? Church it up a little bit. Look at fart. Yeah. What is you, it? You got a family. I, it's it's not. It's there's two in the world. It's like a Bugatti version of like a minivan. What? Yes. <laughs> you have to see this thing. Why? I never even. He's, you, well, he's a big. You don't want to be late taking the kids to school. He's a big car enthusiast. No, it's for them to travel all over Florida. So it's like, if you do, I, Andrew, you probably beat Doug already, didn't you? No. Did you beat Doug. Oh wow. oh wow! He has a lot of cars. No, did you no, put the word Messi family? Put uh, yeah. I already did uh, mini Bugatti, right? Yeah, Bugatti. say Bugatti. No, no, no! Don't no. put Bugatti. I said I it's like that. Oh, I, I didn't say it. Oh, say put uh, Messi minivan, minivan, luxury minivan. Watch it, but it'll that'll try. I'll, for the audience that's listening, I'll have it. I'll get it for the for the YouTube audience, so they'll get to see it. I can't believe we can't find it that easy. I have it in my thread because I sent it. I sent it over to you guys. It's the craziest it literally looks like a bugatti meets a sprinter van oh it's hmm. and it's i, I it's got to be worth millions of dollars like a, just, a bugatti got drunk at the bar yes and uh everybody was leaving and he's like uh, well i've never been with a van what, what do you guys think are the most most profitable uh car the companies Hagen. profitable car companies yeah what are the most what are the tesla. most so tesla oh, is yeah, tesla, tesla. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah do you know how many cars they they sold last year no Three hundred and fifty thousand. Wow. Okay, so they're one okay. of the. They're not the most profitable. There's one ahead of them, by the way. They're the second most profitable. Really? Yeah. You know, is above them. So three hundred fifty thousand cars. You know, is above them. Their margins are like seventeen. Now this is profitable. Profitable. Not total. To not total Ford? volume. Yeah, because no. Ford. Ford's up there because yeah. they they do more volume. Yeah. Than like yeah. Ford. Yeah, but you're talking volume, about margins. Yeah. Yes, economy. margins. Tesla has the best margins. Yeah. You know that? Yeah. They are the best. But that's because they create so much of the so platforms. Most, they most cars, the margins are actually way thinner than you would probably yep. think. You guys only know like three to ten percent. Yeah. It's like a supplement company. Oh wow. Like literally three to ten percent are the are the the profit margins on the average car. Tesla is around seventeen percent. Number one. Who? Yes. Ferrari. For, oh, of course. Okay, Tesla of does three hundred did three hundred and fifty four thousand cars yeah. last year. Ferrari, how many? Thirteen thousand. Yeah, crazy, yeah. right? Yeah. Damn. Well, they 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 do such a good job. They're like De Beers diamonds. Like they do such a good job of of they're shrinking handmade. their controlling. They're handmade. Like they're, yeah. I mean, Tesla's factory they're mass produced. They're not like, trying to sell a lot. Yeah. No, if no. they did, that would. That's ruin one of brand. actually the critiques. I, Andrew, did you ever tell me that? Like, so my you have a Tesla. So the one critique I know everybody's a Tesla person loves their Teslas, but the one critique I've heard there's too many of them. No, is that the um, the craftsmanship, like the, the like the lines of the the trunk aren't always lined up. Really? And yeah. Hmm. My buddy who owns yeah. a couple of them. Hey, what, you, yeah, you have, I mean, you're basically just paying for the tech of the car. Besides uh, that, like it's it's nice and it's modern and it's minimal. 
but like there's much more luxurious cars. Oh, well, of course. That are. I mean, I mean, what's your take now that you're you've been a Tesla owner for a while now? Like, are you a huge fan? It's, would you it's, buy? It's not significantly better than what you would get for other cars in terms of the interior for like the same price, anywhere between thirty to sixty thousand dollars, like the Model Y, the one that I had. Um, but which like the 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 convenient part about it is just the tech, just yeah. the, the driving. Driving on like the, on the highway. By the like way, that. a lot of people don't know this. They have this is what's so um, so incredible about what you're saying. The price of a Tesla has come down significantly. Oh yeah, of the same model yeah. over the years. Oh, I didn't know that. So their margins are huge. They haven't cut into the margins. Yeah. If you look at the price Way of more the economical, oh, options. the price of the of the original Tesla, that same model is getting cheaper and cheaper. I wish I would have known that's, that was his goal. I wish I would have known that stat. I actually, for some reason, I thought Tesla wasn't profitable. I didn't think they were. I thought they were always like try. I thought they were yeah. like he was constantly pouring money into well, it. They were the, one of the only ones that didn't get a bailout, right? No, correct. Yeah, to think that the thing that the average car is three to ten percent, and he's pulling seventeen yeah. percent. Ferrari's twenty four. But to be pulling seventeen percent margins on that is in, incredible. That's, that's in, I mean, if you're if the market is three to ten and you're at double yeah. that, I mean, that's like that's like a, and 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 rivaling some of the biggest producers as far as how many because like four yeah. they're all up there. I want to say three fifty to four hundred thousand is like the top producers. I mean, maybe Doug can fact check me on who sells the most cars. I think Honda, Toyota. I think Toyota. This is such a tough market, and these Toyota's it's, number it's one. It's funny to see that like Apple just completely. Like has like I mean, oh it's Apple, coming is Apple, it because dude Apple car is they coming. keep pushing it out pushing it out pushing it out and I'm like I wonder if they're actually you know oh, why you know why though because Apple is so flush with cash yeah like why would they enter like into a terrible it's like us going into supplements it is it's like us Stop going it. into supplements Strategy. great Stop analogy it. Sal I know you're gonna go there Stop right there it. it is just like my hey, club hey, dipping into supplements listen, want, terrible margins I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm terrible gonna, margins I'm gonna do another call out to the fans listen, uh, I want you to flood uh, these that guys that was a great transition right there flood these guys we don't do supplements say right hey there. let's Sal start a supplement so company so cash heavy so many fitness I promise you listen I'm gonna talk to the fans you guys quiet I promise you guys I promise you I will bring you supplements that are borderline <laughs> illegal. They're going to be the craziest ones you've ever seen. Wow, ten million! Send vehicles. me to South America and the wow, you know Amazon. I'll find. Vehicles. Wow, that's Toyota, right? Toyota. New wow. Goji Toyota berries. is crazy. Hey, uh, I want to say something real quick. Um, a study is. I have to. I have to mention this because we're going to be gone. A study circulating and people are trying to tie like, oh, meat consumption potentially bad for you. This might show that oh, meat God. is. Yeah. Okay. So here's what I want to say about what? studies on. Meat studies on whole eggs, they did this for a while, and anything that's full fat, like full fat dairy. Because of the decades, not years, but decades of the narrative that meat is bad for you, because it's now been, since the 80s, we've been told that red meat is, gonna, is bad for you, saturated fat, it's unhealthy, avoid red meat, eat white meat or fish or whatever, don't eat meat. That what we've now developed, because of that propaganda, is the decades of, of that propaganda has created an un, unhealthy user bias. What that means is mm -hmm. that when you look at just population wide, the people that eat the most meat are people who disregard health because they've ignored all that information. And if you look at people who avoid red meat, you have a healthy user bias. These are all people who try to be healthy. So there's lots of other things that they do that are healthy. So when you look at the best studies on meat, on red meat, natural red meat, not processed, you find it's healthy. Mm -hmm. So I want to say that real quick. Well, so you, we've if, created I, this bias. A great comparison to that is the old school smoking and coffee one. Yeah. yeah. Right? Coffee like, causes cancer yeah. because they never control for smoking. Yes. And they all, we found out that a lot of people who drink coffee in the morning like also to smoke, like to smoke, smoke cigarettes, but right. then they didn't control for that. So right. it's a good example of like how there's a major bias of people that are on a diet versus people who don't give a fuck. Because of the whatever. thousands of years humans have lived off of meat solely. Like, and not just not just me. How are you going to try and like pitch to me that it's been harmful? Not to just us? meat, red meat. Yeah, exactly. Red meat. They weren't hunting chickens. It's total bullshit. Yeah. I feel like you, every one of these kids that think this way should. You just have to watch the show alone. Like just watch, yeah, yeah. just watch an episode. Just watch just, one season, one season of it, and and ask yourself. There's no other food you can eat and still be okay no, and survive. We no. live in. We, we, it's so by funny. the way, white like like people are like, oh, lean meat, eat lean meat. Do you know what happens? You know that you'll starve. Yes, you that's starve. why I say watch alone. It's yeah. such a good. You yeah. eat a bunch of rabbits. It's a very educational and show birds, you for die. understanding how our body operates yeah. on like real whole foods and what types of right. nutrition it's seeking and it needs. 
and like if you wanted to survive, what you need to go find. And yes, fish and white white meat. Well, dude, would not I blame be the fact that everybody's so removed from the process of actually getting food. Yeah, you know, and, and hunting for it or like doing what you have to do um in order to you know get that kind of nourishment it's like everything's so readily available we just listen to the marketers tell us where to go next yeah totally all right so the shout out did you want to do the shout out adam with the what was i just talking about oh the, god the, you mentioned want, someone yeah. brian I monarch a, i got like, yeah, oh, brian monarch it's he's well, like a, a, he's like a deep fake guy who does like everything from arnold over everything oh, to dude that. it's so funny he's really good yeah He's really, no, you had mentioned someone else yeah. earlier on the podcast. I did. I don't remember what it was. That's what okay. we were talking about. Yeah. Brian Monarch well, it is then. Next time. Oh, it was the documentary. That's what it was. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I will do it on another one. NutriSense is a company that pairs uh, glucose monitors, CGMs. Okay. So you wear this on your arm and it monitors your glucose in real time. It pairs that with nutrition experts. In other words, you'll get nutrition coaching who also uses your CGM to tailor and individualize your diet. Nobody else does this. But NutriSense, it's incredible. It's effective. Uh, it's one of the most effective strategies I've seen in my entire career. So if you want to get leaner, get more fit, you want an individualized approach, literally that's measuring your glucose and working with a nutrition expert, go to NutriSense.io forward slash mind pump. NutriSense is spelled N-U-T-R-I-S-E-N-S-E. -E. Use the code mind pump and get yourself a discount. All right, back to the show. First question is from Eric Duenas. What techniques or exercises will help with back thickness? I have good width, but lack that 3D look. Dead you lift. Down dead with the lift. thickness. I love this question because it, there's controversy around this. For some weird reason, there's still fitness dorks out there that don't think deadlifting builds a back. And this is exactly like, okay, so I got nine... I think nine years under my, my Bro, belt. Bro, can you lift. please, please find that before and Bro, after? it's so old now. Can you please find right. it? It is the most profound, like, and you went from, it wasn't like a beginner to, you'd already been lifting forever. You're yeah. already a pro. The difference in your back from not deadlifting to deadlifting. In fact, I think you eliminated most exercises. Everything. All I did, so. <laughs> it's so crazy. The audience that's listened for a long time has probably heard this story and they're over it or whatever. But for the people that haven't heard this story, when we all met and got together, my history of lifting was very, very bodybuilder-esque. And I rarely ever squatted and deadlifted. I never deadlifted, but and I rarely squatted. Intermittently, I squatted. I was definitely leg press, lunge guy, all that shit. And when we all got together, uh, Sal was a really, really strong deadlifter. And I had never said, you know what? Let, let's see if I can get my deadlift up. And, and see if I can actually improves my back. And literally not actually fully adopting this philosophy until this point. And all I cared about at that point was I'm going to try and get up to as much weight as he was. And at that time I started, I was only, I was only able to deadlift like 225 pounds. Over a, a course of a year, I worked all the way up to 550. Now keep in mind, I hadn't really deadlifted at all. So the, the gains like that are unprecedented, right? Yeah. And so it was a new movement for you. You already had a ton of muscle. Yes. Yeah. And I, I, I had a good physique. I had a real wide back. Yeah. I'd, I'd already been competing, won some shows. It probably went from 225 to like 400 real fast. And then real, it started to get Yeah, harder, yeah, right? yeah. Okay. That's where it got, that's where it slowed down after 400 and it creeped up. But the biggest thing is I never had those, what they call like the canals. Yeah, the columns. Yeah, down the column, back. yeah. columns or canal down your back. And which gives you that thick looking. I was always wide. I had a small waist. I had, I had a big lats. And so I had this, a wide back, but it wasn't deep 3D, whatever look. And it was the deadlifting that completely thick. I mean, I got wider and thicker from yeah. deadlifting. Yeah. The width of the back comes from the lats. The thickness is the erector spinae, the rhomboids, the lower and mid trapezius. And there's a lot of muscles in the back, but those are the ones that are really going to give you that that thick look. Now, I understand aesthetics. So bodybuilding definitely made back width like a big thing. Like it was all, it, it was like, oh, you know, you go up there, you do a pose called a lat spread, which a lat spread is specifically a bodybuilding pose. Nobody walks around that way. There's no function to doing a lat spread other than showing how wide your lats look. Um, in real, in the real we world, call it invisible I, lat syndrome where the guy walks around the gym. Like oh this. God, it looks like he's pu pushing a wheelbarrow. Yeah. yeah. Um, in the real world, back thickness is what shows up, not necessarily. Width, width will show up too, but what looks impressive when you're just standing relaxed 
is thickness. Now, why do we find that so impressive when someone's standing relaxed? That's function. Lats definitely are functional. I'm not saying they're not. They're very big muscles. They're very important. But that thickness is what stabilizes the spine. It's what makes you be able to lift things. It's what makes your core strong. Um, and it's just it just sends that signal to someone looking at you who's, and they, they see you and they go, oh God, that guy or that girl, they really fit. Like even for women, here's what's funny because we talk about back size and muscularity and the average woman's like, I don't want that. When women have a well-developed back, they have that nice dip in the back. That the canal. Thickness gives it, yes. That canal. Yeah. And so you wear like a low cut dress or whatever. Oh, on looks, women, it looks gorgeous. Looks I mean, it, I mean, uh, curve and shape. I mean, men, yeah. men and women, I think the more yeah. curve, more shape, muscular curve and shape that you have in the body, the more 3D yeah. you look, the more defined, the more muscular, the more fit you look. I've never met a guy, okay, this guy, I think Eric is the person who's asking the question. I've never met a guy who can deadlift 400 more pounds that didn't have a thick back. Yeah. So go get that 400 pounds. Like yeah. I've never met somebody who is deadlifting 400 or more pounds, which is a, an attainable goal for most all men, okay? 400 pounds that didn't have a thick back. Yeah, so uh, deadlifts for, at the top, and then under that has to be uh, a non-chest supported barbell row or a or pen lay row. Stones. Oh, geez. rounded back. Oh, yeah, my God. Yeah, I mean, you, that's true. Right? That's true. I mean, everybody discounts that, but it's it's functional strength that actually produces that kind so of. So I'm going to make the back. case for that right now. And and if you don't have an Atlas stone, which you probably don't, uh, you could do a Zercher deadlift, yeah, which really will give heavy, you something similar. Uh, sandbag, right? So what it produces, what what it what happens with an Atlas stone lift or a Zercher deadlift or, um, you know, lifting a heavy sandbag, is what's called rounded back lifting. Now, not rounded from the low back standpoint, but rather. When you're hugging something like this, your scapula has to spread and your thoracic is, some, is, is rounded to an extent. Now, why that produces so much back thickness, we now know with data, when a muscle is loaded in a stretched position, yep. you tend to cause more muscle hypertrophy and or growth. And where else do you put the the lats in this stretched position? You mean the, in a, you, the, in, the, in, the rhomboids? Or rhomboids yeah, rhomboids, traps. And even the lats, because lats are getting spread out that way too, are all in that stretch position and in an isometric contraction. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. You don't see that. Yeah. So, and you know, look if you look at the Greek statues, because he mentions in the in the question that Doug didn't read this part, but he says, "I want my back to look like the statue of Hercules." Have you guys ever seen? Oh, it's cool. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe Doug, yeah. you could pull up Hercules uh, statue, Greek Hercules. It's statue. one of those. Where look it's at his like, back. Yeah, it just looks super strong. You know, like the physique. It's like really like uh, pronounced. There was no bodybuilding back then. No, it wasn't, so they were literally creating. It wasn't bubbly. Let's what, say what they knew to to be functional. Like, well, we know strong people. This is what they typically look like. And well, if you part look of at what back, that Atlas does too is like so your your core wraps all the way around your spine too, which is part, part of your low back muscles is part of the core. And yeah. so massive core stability in an exercise like that too. So you're developing that really, really well. Yeah. Let's see a picture. It's disconnected, Doug. Those are pretty mountains though. Yeah. Man, that back looks... Uh, <laughs> yeah, look at this yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look back. at the thickness on yeah, that, dude. Yeah. You see a guy like that walking away from you? Yeah. I mean, we've talked about this. I'm not going to bother him. We've talked about this on and off air before. <laughs> Uh, He's got I can too, see I can see a competitor hey. posing on Instagram and know if how they or how not. how well or if they even deadlift at I all. Know. Yeah. Like I can see that right away. And a good example of this on the elite elite level on in competing is Seabum. Yeah. L the way he is built, he's built like a guy who squats and deadlifts really heavy. Yeah. And mm -hmm. just he Doesn't has avoid those. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and a lot of competitors unfortunately do today. So. Go after the deadlift, no matter what you hear from some of these other fitness dorks that think that it's not a good back exercise. Yeah. Next question is from S. Hashim. I'm eating 1,500 calories, do CrossFit five oh. days, oh. and I'm running MAPS Anabolic two days. <laughs> I can't seem to lose fat. Help. Uh, yeah. Help. Yeah. Am I doing too much? Yeah. yeah. Here's what you're doing. Way you're Way too much. Here's what you're doing to your body. Okay. First off, CrossFit workouts um, are super intense, typically too intense. Not the best way to burn body fat or you know get to those kind of goals. CrossFit workouts are great though if you want to get good at CrossFit. So I'll say that. Um, but they're very intense. Five days a week of CrossFit is too much CrossFit 
for 90, 95 or How maybe even ninety nine percent. How tall and weight? Like yeah. we, did, we didn't get any of that. Shit, I don't even. I don't even care. I don't, care. I don't even care if this is a hundred and ten pound girl. Oh yeah, yeah. no, I know. that's it's still way but... too low of calories. Way too yeah. much crossfitting and yeah. adding maps and a ball. So, Are you kidding? Yeah. So so here's totally. what here's what's happening. Tons of intense crazy workouts. You're probably not recovering fully from them, or your body can only heal. It's not adapting. And you're also only eating 1,500 calories. Literally, literally what you're telling your body to do is survive. Yeah. Survive the onslaught. The environment is crazy right now. And so what your body, your body's insurance policy against stress, one of the insurance policies against stress is fat. I mean, for most of human history, starvation was a real risk, a real problem. Stored body fat is an insurance policy. You beat yourself up like this. And your body's not going to want to lose body fat. It's going to plateau. And in fact, what it'll do is it'll make you burn muscle or lose muscle, I should say, in order to slow your metabolism down. What you need to do is eliminate the CrossFit, mm -hmm. continue doing MAPS Anabolic, slowly bump your calories up over time, start to build some muscle, let your hormones rebalance, let your body recover, and little by little get your metabolism faster. When you get up to a point when you're eating 2,500 calories or 3,000 calories and you feel good and you're strong and your body weight really didn't change much or maybe just a little bit went up, then you can cut from there and then boom, like magic, fat will come off your body. Yeah, I wish this person didn't just post on Instagram. I wish this was a caller so we could actually go back and yeah, have some dialogue here. Talk because about. <laughs> I, somebody who's down this path, like um, I would like to hear their their where they're at mentally. I'd like to know exactly for- How just long they've been doing it. Yeah, this know. is- But I, I love that it's brought up here because this it highlights the point that we always make. You know, this is- this is the problem with, you know, purely thinking the, you know, going from a law of thermodynamics, right? Calories in versus calorie calories out. Like here's an example of somebody who has got to be burning tons and tons and tons of calories by all of this CrossFit and anabolic working out and only eating 1500. Yet, why is my body not losing, yeah. losing any more weight? And it's become adapted to what you're throwing at it. And not only is that massively overtraining weights, and even if you were fed, you still would not be recovering. There's nowhere else to go with this. But then you're also you can't go harder. You're not getting, you're not hitting nutritional targets, being being as low as 1500. So then you're not giving yourself yeah. adequate calories and nutrients to recover. So you're at both ends. You're over overdoing it on the training and underdoing it on the nutrition. And of course you're stalled yeah. and you're not seeing any results. You're, no, you're not probably you getting stronger. You're not getting any. You're not getting any better at anything. You're surviving is what you're doing. Yeah, your, bo best. your body's under attack twenty four seven. By the way, now. if you stay on this long enough, not only will you not lose body fat, you're going to get injured, get sick. Yep. Really mess up your hormones and your body's going to scream. It's going to start to scream at you. You're doing too much and eating too little. Next question is from Tyler Lavasseur. What are some key strategies you have used to help improve client adherence? Oh, okay. Mm. So this is going to be great for coaches, but also shock for- Shock callers. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't show up, <laughs> shock the shit out of you. It is effective. Yeah. This, I've had so, clients ask for This is like good for, co for coaches, but this is also good for people listening right now who have who struggle with you know discipline themselves. Look, yeah, yeah. As a coach, and again, this applies to everybody, but as a coach, the most important thing you need to focus on with your client is helping them create this as a daily, sorry, as a consistent habit. How can I get this person to adopt this lifestyle for the rest of their life? That's the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is not how do I get them the fastest results? The goal is not how do I make them the most sore? How do I beat them up? It's literally how can I train them in a way so that they eventually learn and want to do this for the rest of their life. And the first most important thing is you have to figure out how to create an experience that the client will find both challenging so that it's meaningful, but also enjoyable. Now, enjoyable doesn't necessarily mean pleasurable. This is where people tend to screw up. In pleasurable is also enjoyable, but there's lots of things that we do that are hard and challenging that we also find enjoyable because we you know, get new milestones or we learn things or we, we start to enjoy the process of growth. So when clients would show up for me, and this is later, because I didn't understand this forever, but later I figured this out. My job was to create that kind of experience for my client. And the, number one was meeting them where they're at. That was the most important thing. They're, people are, are ready to move forward when they're ready to move forward. In other words, they're ready to work out harder when they're ready. They're ready to change new things in their diet when they're ready. This doesn't mean you lie to them. You're honest with them. But if you push them beyond that capability, what will happen is they'll eventually falter, fail. If they do that enough times, they're going to stop. They're not going to want to do this anymore. So it was all about meeting them where they were, 
being honest about the process and creating that experience where they actually enjoyed it. And once I was able to do that, it was, it was, it was game on. I mean, I, I love this question because it really, it forces us to communicate, um, where the root of a lot of our philosophy comes from, right? Like we have to take all the science and experience and stuff that we have in, in the health and fitness space. And then we have to take the behaviors, uh, human behaviors of people and like what, get, what makes them go, what makes, what demotivates them, what motivates them. And we have to find a way to, to, to be a very successful coach and trainer. You have to find a way to, to blend that. If you purely just go by science stuff like that, not everybody's going to follow and adhere to it. In fact, most people won't. So that, that's why when we we give out information sometimes and there's like somebody who wants to count, oh, well, I heard this person say this. So it's like, okay, well, that's great. That's I understand that's what the research says. I also know the human psychology around that. And one of the things that I've learned through training clients also now from being having a, a son and being a father and having self-awareness around the things that I like, like the stuff, the, the sports that you gravitated to, the board games that you like to do, a lot of the times it's because the experience you had you enjoyed. A lot of times part of the enjoyment is you were good at it or you won, right? Like it's like you played that first time you picked up a, any of that's played a sport, like that sport you were drawn to was the one you probably naturally were kind of good at or you had success with. So understanding that human psychology and how that applies to this, here they are on this new venture. I'm going to go after lifting weights and eating better. And so you need to make sure that they they have a, a good positive experience. One of the ways that you can make sure that happens is by stacking up wins. So a big mistake that trainers do is they want to teach them everything all at once. Oh, we're going to change this and we're going to do this. And then you're going to start doing this and you're going to start doing it because their, their thought is like, oh, my client told me I want to get the fastest results right away. So you think, oh, I'm going to show them everything they need to do to get the fastest results. Like, no, the fastest results is a thing that's going to keep them consistent for the longest period of time. That's what's going to get them to go faster. And if you understand be, uh, the behavioral psychology around people building and stacking these wins, so that's my goal. So my goal to Sal's point is meet them where they're at, which could be as little. Sal's told the story before of getting my client to read one page <laughs> about nutrition, or it could be all I want you to do is three times a week, go for a 20 minute walk, or it could be, I just want you to show up to the gym one day a week. It doesn't matter. Or it could be someone who's already going three, four days. And now you're adding one little thing, a nutritional tip, or you look at their diet and you see they're, it's all over the board. Mm -hmm. They're not doing this. They're not doing that. Instead of changing everything you go, I just want you to, to add one high protein meal a day. I want you to add one bowl of vegetables, like find ways every week to give them these tiny little goals that you, you feel confident that they can accomplish and then celebrate the wins. That's and it. And I'm so glad you're defining wins because this is the other problem trainers make. They think wins means you got to lose five pounds. No. Or you need to add 10 pounds no. to the bar. Those are wins, but those aren't all the wins. Yeah. You know, I remember, you know, I, I remember this one conversation. I had a client who came back from vacation and she was so upset. And I said, well, you know, what, what? She's like, I failed. I mean, what do you mean you failed? She's like, I had dessert every night on vacation, every single night. And I said, okay. I said, I know your goal was to not have any dessert. I said, but what did you used to do on vacation? She's like, well, I would have dessert all day. I'd have dessert for breakfast. I'd have dessert for lunch. I'd have dessert for dinner. I'm like, this is a big deal. You only had dessert once. Notice how I reframe that. She's like, I had dessert every night. I said, you only had dessert once. All of a sudden, she was like, you're right. I totally did a lot better than I used to. That's right. That's a win. We're and moving to, in the right direction. You have to help coach the... Now, now, to the person who's listening who's not a coach or a trainer, this is how you hack yourself. Yes. This is how you get yourself to create this relationship or this experience with fitness where you start to, God, I want to... I want to keep doing this. By the way, okay, I remember, I, 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 oh God, in the early days, if, sometimes I look back and I cringe at some of the ways I, I, I thought when it came to fitness. I remember I had this one trainer that worked for me and we always gave her the really, really tough clients, like the clients that just didn't want to show up or whatever. And I remember there's this one lady she trained and I don't know, I don't know, one out of three workouts, this lady would show up, they would do one exercise and then they'd go for a walk outside. And I remember thinking like, oh, and I mean, she was a good trainer. Clients resigned with her. So I, I at least was smart enough to not like, you know, harp on her. But I remember thinking to myself, like, what a waste of time. Like, you're just going to, the, you're going to walk. Like, that's so dumb. Like, what later I realized the brilliance in what she was doing. This person showed up. 
to her, this was a big deal. Yeah. So they showed up. So they, what probably happened is she called, like, I don't want to come to the gym. What's the matter? I really, I don't feel good. Listen, we don't have to do much. Let's do one exercise. Let's go for a walk. Really? I can just do that? Absolutely. And this person was consistent week in and week out doing yeah, that's right. that. That's right. Like that was totally brilliant. So that's, that's in my opinion, the most important thing. Now there's a lot of things you could do with the experience for the client. You know, one thing I used to love to do when people would show up to my studio was I'd yell their name out. Hey, John. Hey, what's going on? High five, hug. We'd have conversations. Mm -hmm. I'd make people enjoy. I'd, I'd switch the music to something that someone loved. I had a person who showed up who the stimulus was too high for them. So I had a separate room. I turned the lights off. We'd work out in there with no music. Yeah, it's all individual. Yes. Like each client has their own little unique characteristics and things that they're interested in. And that's what you gather in the very beginning is like, what are their interests? What do they do outside this? What do they do for work? What's their family like? Like, you're just having that constant dialogue so you can ask them questions that, that get them. Because um, people like talking about what's going on in their life. Not a lot of people listen to, uh, you know, what's happening and then the latest thing that's happened in their life. Like, you don't have to just sit there and talk about, you know, fitness and reps oh, and, good point. and nutrition and, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, like get over yourself. Like this is another human being that just uh, you're, you're spending time with and building a relationship with. Uh, obviously, you're steering the the fitness and the nutrition and everything in the right direction. But, you know, that's sort of ancillary to what uh, you're doing in terms of hanging out. It's such a be, long play. Be likable and build wins. Literally. Be likable, build wins. Yep. Like that's all you just By the literally- way, do that to yourself if yeah. you're not a coach. Yeah. Be likable to yourself. What does that mean? Yeah. Don't beat the shit out of yourself when you go to the gym. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, I'm so fat. Oh, my God, I'm so terrible. I didn't do as good. Oh, I should have worked out harder. Are you liking yourself right now? Why the hell would you want to show up and keep doing this to yourself? And set wins like that That's to yourself. Like yeah. the, every time I go from a, a kick where I would consider myself kind of off the wagon, where I'm inconsistent, whatever that, and I decide, okay, and I'm going to turn it up. I don't go full bore right away. It's literally every week I make minor adjustments, just tiny ones, easy ones. Ones that I know, well, you know, I haven't been walking at all after mm -hmm. meals. That's all I'm going to do. Oh, I haven't been making sure that I'm getting that extra pro. Okay, I'm going to do that. And like, and it's crazy that I still do that same reverse psychology on myself is I get that like momentum of building wins. And you know what? You're and it's inevitable you're gonna have these setbacks, but when you're when you're stacking small wins, the setbacks are really small too. Yeah. And then you get right back on it's a lot easier to get right back By on the By the way, horse it's a very clear again. picture. It's mm -hmm. actually an honest objective picture. What's what happens is people don't they don't even calculate or consider, they're not even letting themselves be aware of the small wins. They only focus on the big wins, which is the long win. And then all the small yeah. fails along the way. So well, that's many gonna, things to point out. That's going to paint a shitty picture. Of course, you're going to stop. Next question is from Cavalier Coach. How do I train a client with diabetes on how to work out and what, when, and how much to eat? Okay, so this might sound very specific to people with diabetes, but this, <laughs> this is going to apply to everybody. So obviously, diabetes, your body is uh, becoming resistant to insulin. So what, me, what that means is, your body, when it releases insulin, insulin tells the body to do a few things, very important things. Um, and when your body stops recognizing the amount of insulin that you're sending, it has to produce more and more and more. And over time, you develop diabetes, which can become uh, you know, quite detrimental. It's actually one of the leading causes of uh, chronic health uh, issues and death. Okay, The most effective thing you could do to improve your insulin sensitivity is build muscle. Mm -hmm. Period. End of story. Mm -hmm. Period. End of story. Nothing is more effective at improving insulin sensitivity besides also the diet stuff. And we'll talk about that, like building muscle. So if you have diabetes or you don't want to get diabetes or you just want improved insulin sensitivity because you're reading about how great that is for longevity and cognition, build muscle. Muscle itself is a, is in a storage vessel for processed, for the, the sugars and carbohydrates that we process in the body. It stores glycogen. Besides the liver, where a huge amount of glycogen is stored, it's also the muscle. And insulin is what tells your body to store glycogen. Well, we don't have a lot of muscle. The glycogen doesn't have a lot of places to go. So insulin comes up, glycogen's got nowhere to go. Your body is exposed to lots of insulin. Nothing's happening. starts to become resistant. And the studies show this. Studies on severely obese individuals who build a little bit of muscle, don't even lose weight, have significant improvements in the markers that, you know, that show whether or not you're doing good or bad uh, with things like diabetes. Whereas, you know, other forms of exercise don't do this. 
Um, and even dietary strategies don't necessarily do this as a the irony. The irony of the advice to this person is it's the same advice you give to a normal person that was trying to lose exactly. weight. Mm -hmm. It's like eat whole foods. I would never tell a client to not pair carbohydrates with a protein and a fat. So you yeah. want balance, right? So when they eat stuff like that, so you're you're not you don't want to eat this high glycemic carbohydrate with no no right. protein or fat. You want to make sure that you you pair the the carbohydrates with a protein and fat. So whole foods balanced balanced meals carbs proteins and fats and build muscle that's it. eat in a slight calorie surplus not a massive one not a crazy deficit slight calorie surplus uh, okay. and go build muscle you gotta pause right there because that's so so that's so important somebody right now is freaking out what do you mean a calorie surplus mm -hmm. i thought you had to eat less to work with diabetes yes in the short term cutting your calories will improve your numbers but what we're talking about is fueling the muscle growth that is going to give you the long-term ability to manage your glucose. That's why Adam said eating a slight surplus. It's not a huge surplus. It's a small surplus, just enough to fuel the muscle growth. By the way, I do want to make another comment on this is that if you train somebody with diabetes with strength training too hard, you, you can run into problems as well mm -hmm. because if the stress is Depleting too high, all the stores, yeah. oh yeah, if the stress is too high, the signal goes to the liver to dump a shit ton of glycogen. And so I've had this happen with a client. I had a client who had diabetes is before I understood. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the type of client that a, a CGM would be fun to have. Oh, God. Right? Yes. So, I mean, now that we have access to stuff like that with like companies like NutriSense, I mean, having a CGM on a client like that, so you could measure, oh, wow, when we push this hard, look what yeah. happened. On, on, you so ever had a long-term client? I mean, type 2 diabetes, obviously, but it has been reversed. Yes, amazing yes. oh, yeah what an amazing thing yeah that, you so know. you've had that uh-huh oh isn't it crazy i couldn't believe it yeah. now was that before you knew that could happen yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i was like it was, i was tripping out because the doctor was like very impressed but it was like a, a long time a long you know form of consistency of like building better habits but yeah full, full reversal yeah so um so here's the three things that i'll say for this uh one is eat a high protein diet that's very very good at controlling uh blood glucose two Build muscle. We just said that. And then here's number three. After meals, especially carbohydrate containing or sugar containing meals, move a little bit, five to 10 minutes, like go for a walk. Now here's why. When you eat it, when you eat the carbohydrate, you know, the, the, the glucose goes into the blood. Think of the muscles as sponges by moving them, just by contracting them, by walking your it's like squeezing a sponge and then letting it relax in water. What's it going to do? It's going to suck up the water. Just by moving the muscles, they'll suck up more of that blood sugar and make the insulin more effective. And it's very, those three things right there are like the, the key, like high protein, strength train, and then after your meals, go for like a five to 10 minute walk and, and, and you'll if, see massive improvements. And if you yeah. can get this client to invest in a CGM, there's tremendous value around yeah, having monitoring a, a tool like this to monitor. And, and mainly so you can help them make the connection of all the things we're talking about right now. Mm -hmm. Like you, they go and do the walk and you're like, see the difference? Look how much your spike leveled out. It didn't spike as high because right after you ate, you went and did this. Such and a so, good point. And so you can use the CGM and then even you as a coach and a trainer, you know, you can gauge the intensity level Level. Like, you know, so where you're like, oh, I want to push them and I want to challenge them, but I want to do it so hard that they have this massive rebound and spike from it. So it's like you can use that to teach them about intensity, the way they train, about meal timing, yeah. about pairing. You Eating can see when they first, yeah. when they eat a, eat a carbohydrate without pairing it with a protein, mm -hmm. even if it's a healthy food. And they don't realize like, oh, wow, what a difference it makes when I have, you know, six almonds with that that banana. It makes a huge difference. Like you, you start to notice all these little things that you can then teach them those behaviors. And so there's a lot of value. I mean, I think there's value in CGMs no matter what, but especially with a client that has diabetes. Totally. Look, if you like our show, and you probably do because you're here, um, go check out mindpumpfree.com. We got a bunch of free fitness guides that'll help you with your fitness goals. You can also find us all on Instagram. Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at mindpumpdestefano. And Adam is at mindpumpadam. Adam.